and you're very welcome. This is Fintan Dunn. With me is Cathy McMahon, the founder of Irish First Mothers. Thank you, Fintan. And today we have our fifth testimony session. Okay. Who will we be hearing from today, Cathy? Today we're hearing from Mags, who was in Besbra in 1966-67, and she's now in her early 60s. Okay. Welcome, Mags, and we're delighted to have you here. Yeah, thanks very much, Cathy. What was it like arriving in Besbra? Well, you can imagine, I was 15 years of age, so we came via Dublin, mm-hmm. and then we came to train to Dublin, and then down to Cork on the train. Now, you know, I hadn't had many trips to Dublin, I can tell you that, in my whole lifetime mm-hmm. at that age. So it was quite um, an experience, and I suppose I was 15 years of age, and you know, at 15, you really, you know, you think this is a trip, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was it. But I arrived in Besborough, and I thought it was an awful big house, because I came from a very small house. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Reverend Mother took me in, and my mother went and left me very quickly, and I was very scared, mm-hmm. that's all I can say. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it wasn't too long anyway, and they had me, given me a new name, mm-hmm. and uh, they changed my name, and uh, I don't know, I, I think it, the shame started from there when they changed my name, that I, mm-hmm. I knew that I was anonymous, Yeah. and um, already I felt a lot of uh, low self-esteem, and I felt like bad because I'd been told how bad I had been. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just felt worthless, basically. But it was to get a lot worse. I was put in a dormitory with other women. I was younger than the other women. Mm -hmm. I had to get up early and go to mass, and I had to wash and scrub floors and do work, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the baby wasn't due until January, so I was put in there very early because my mother didn't want anyone to see me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I went there in July 1967. Yeah. So it was an awful shock to my system, and I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to leave, but I really didn't allow us out very much in the grounds. But one of the girls had told me that a girl ran away, and I thought, God, that's exactly what I could do. Mm. So she told me where the farm no I just kind of questioned them and they told me where the farmyard was and all this and I inquired and they told me that the farm led on to the Limerick Road and I was taking it all in and I was there ne- nearly three weeks and I had it all in my head I was gone mm. so one morning I think it was a Sunday morning off I went at mass time and out I went out through the farm I knew the way the whole lot and off I went on the Limerick Road and I was 15 years of age yeah. Never been out of Sligo very much. And I tummed a lift to Limerick. Mm. So I got to Limerick and I had no money. All I had was what I stood up in. I was like a convict running. Yeah. That's all I can say. Mm. Ran and I ran and I ran. I was afraid of my life to bring me back. And uh, when I got to Limerick anyway, I didn't know what to do because I knew I needed to get the bus to Sligo. So I went into the friary and I told the man that my mother mm-hmm. was dying, the priest that my mother was dying, and uh, I needed money. And he gave me three pounds. Mm. I always remember him giving me three pounds, mm-hmm. the poor friar. And I got the bus. And I was cute enough, I got an underage fare for under 14, like <laughs> or 14 or whatever it was meant to be. <laughs> and uh, I, me- I remember your man looking at me on the bus, all right. Anyway, I arrived home, and I wasn't very welcome, let me tell you. And I was marched back, not the next day, but the following day, and I wasn't allowed out. So I was marched back there and then. Mm-hmm. And I, ha- you know, and all I can say is, I have to, say, I- I'll say this while I remember it, on under the Freedom to Information Act, I looked for my papers, and it did say on the papers how I absconded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so, like, I, you know, I was quite shocked by that, you know, the fact that I absconded, I needed to abscond. Yeah. Because I was absolutely horrified by the place. That's really why I left it. Mm. Well, you must have been. So anyway, yeah. oh, I was horrified, yeah, 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 I couldn't, the shock to the system, mm. you see, 
my mother, I was put so far away from home, like. Yeah. You know? Well, fair and play. And I had no visitors. Mm-hmm. Fair play mm-hmm. to your resilience and to your adventurism and to your determination to get up and get that under you and get out of there. Yeah. Um, get out of but, it. But, yeah. uh, you know, did that change then how you were dealt oh, with? Oh, no. I, w- I was treated much worse when I came back. Mm-hmm. I was put up on the top floor, up beside a nun's room. They were going to keep a good tight eye on me. Mm-hmm. So I still had to do all the work and get up early and everything. And I suppose. I felt a bit broken, you know, like me escape didn't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that was it anyway. I went on and, you know, there were several things that happened in in the place. You know, I remember one time we all had to go to the dentist and they got this minibus and we all were brought out to the dentist in Cork City. And I never felt like more like a criminal in my life on this bus. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We were like the chain gang. We just weren't cuffed to each other. That was basically it. Yeah. You know, and I felt the shame when I went in. Everyone knew where we came from. Yeah. You know, that's only one incident. Yeah. And I suppose the other stuff was that we were sinners and we were told to go to Mass and confession and Holy Communion and pray for our souls. and Like, that was a a daily reminder how sinful we were. You know, the nuns thought we were sinful people. Mm-hmm. And I was fifteen, you know. Mm. Like I've, I've I was, only, I was only forming my, my character, you might say. Yeah. yeah so exactly. you can imagine, you can imagine what the psychological effect all this had on me. Mm. Well, I'd say, you know, I've heard similar stories about those re-education camps set up in Cambodia in the Pol Pot yeah. regime. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. to constantly <laughs> harangue you about your deficiencies, how you need to swear loyalty to the party and all this kind of rubbish. Yeah. You, you were getting the full yeah. treatment there. Yeah. 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 That's right. But anyway, it, it went on and I done me work and I got up early and I went to mass and I went to confession and I went and done everything I had to do. And um, the baby was born in, in January. Uh, he was a little boy and he was nine pounds but I was three days in labour and I think this was the thing that really damaged me I was left three days in labour and now and again this unqualified lady came in I can't you know she wasn't a midwife she was a lady that was there herself at one time Mm -hmm. and she helped the women you know yeah and that was the only kind of treatment I got you know and she checked me every now and again to see how far dilated I was or whatever it was and it took three days for this little baby to arrive Mm -hmm. and I went into the maternity into the labour ward and the baby uh, he was nine pounds I suppose that was a bit of difficulty big baby for my age and I ended up having an episiotomy now there was no pain relief whatsoever I mean this was the most appalling thing. And I didn't know at the time that you were meant to get pain relief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't know anything. I had no sex education, no baby education, nothing. I didn't, I, I hardly, barely knew where the baby was coming from. Yeah. Like, you know, and I'm not exaggerating. I was very, very naive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was there having this baby and I had to have an episiotomy and the nun midwife done the episiotomy. Now, I can't put names on anyone. Mm-hmm. my god it was horrendous horrendous and then a young doctor stitched me up he probably was a junior doctor I don't know where he came out well he didn't talk to me he didn't look at me or he didn't even tell me what was going on I didn't know what was going on I mm-hmm. didn't know that there were I knew I had been cut I didn't know what was going on it was horrendous and uh, you know it's horrific that's it's uh, horrific. I was pretty broken. But how pretty did, broken. H- how did they think you were going to medically survive three days like that at your age uh, and with such a, a delivery? I don't know. That, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I don't even know if they even thought about that. And was the other mother oh. or the other woman who was, you presume, a, a resident as well, was she kind to you? Oh, she was kind to me, no, she was. But she wasn't over, you know, she wasn't in sitting holding me hand around. She'd just come in and check me. And when she checked me, she was kind to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know. Now all I knew was what the girls had told me how how everything goes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But you can imagine when the baby was born. Now I didn't see him right away. I didn't see him. I can't remember when I saw him, but I don't think it was right away. It was mm. probably the next day when I saw him. Yeah. And you can imagine this wee baby. It was, you know, the first, the love I had for this child. You know yourself, Kathy. The love I had for this child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My my little baby. Yeah. And um, I can't remember. We were left so long in allowed feeding them every day. I think it was about a week. How long were you kept in bed, like, after going through such a horrific delivery, like, with the episiotomy? I can't remember how long I was left in bed. Right. I really can't remember. I think a lot of it is a blur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It would be yeah, after but that. I, mm. Yeah. I know a while after, anyway, I had to go back to work, you know, to do my chores, and the baby was left in the nursery with somebody else to feed it. Mm. And we used to get in at certain times. And, and But the only thing was that I wasn't, the baby was only four weeks old and my mother relented and took me out of there. With the baby? With the baby, but no, the, she wasn't having the baby at home. You know, she had arranged probably with the nuns. The baby was taken to the town I came from and was put into an orphanage. My mother wouldn't allow me to take the baby home. Right. So th- that's when you parted? So that's when we parted, and uh, that was horrendous. Yeah. Horrendous. How, and um, How did they deal with that? How did they deal with that? Were you given any, uh, a chance to say goodbye to your infant child? You know, I give them to the nun in the orphanage, and um, I remember being very traumatised by it, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I was determined I was going to come and get him, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the father of the child was older than me, and my mother had threatened law on him, so he was afraid to come near me. But we did kind of arrange that we'd leave and go to England together and we'd try and find a way to f- keep the child. Right. Because his parents wanted him to step back from me as well, because they were afraid as well that their son would get mm-hmm. into bother, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And. and the- um, we did go to England. We ran away to England. I was getting very good at the running away. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> but when we went to England, I suppose, I mean, I'd been through so much. I needed an awful lot of support and help, and he wasn't able to give it. Yeah. He, he just went out on the town, and he found another woman, and I went off down to Tesco and got a job. And um, I thought I'd be able to keep the child, but looking back now, I was very traumatised. Uh, and I would honestly say I had prostate Dramatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. I know now what I had. Yeah. But, uh, and I broke out in psoriasis all over and I had to be hospitalised. From the trauma? From the trauma, I'd say. You know, I never had psoriasis before, but it came, it came on me and it was like maps of Ireland all over me. Yeah, it yeah. Was just horrendous. The stress, you know? your immune system as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have it, of course, to this day, but... Um, I was alone now in London. You hadn't managed At 16 to years of age, I was alone. Yeah. Right. The baby was back so I had in, nobody. Sligo, in the orphanage. The baby, yeah, that's right. Uh, and then I went missing. I didn't want my, parent, my mother to know where I was. Yeah. Now my father, my father used to go missing and he'd be in jail and all sorts of things. But I didn't want them to know where I was, so... But anyway, they tracked me down through the Irish Centre. Right. In London. How long afterwards? Not long, I'd say. It was around uh, September. Because my son was nine months before he was adopted because I was trying to find a way to keep him. Mm -hmm. So they tracked me down and they produced the papers and I had to sign them. I I was forced into signing the adoption papers. By my parents. Yeah. And that was in London, was it? Or, or how, how? That was in London, and mm-hmm. they posted them back. Yeah, that's how I signed the adoption papers. I'm I don't know where they got them from. They must have got them from Sligo or somewhere. Yeah. Because it was the Sligo Adoption Agency. 
the Saint Attractus. Saint Attractus, that's the one I think. Yeah. 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 And what happened then uh, uh, from London? What happened then was, I suppose, I kind of got myself together a bit and I, I got a better job and um, I, I stayed in London for a little while and I, I came back then again. And then when I came home, uh, a priest and a peace commissioner, the priest brought me out to the peace commissioner's house and I had to sign the final adoption papers. And I, had to, I signed them in the back of a car, sitting in the back of a car, that is the God's truth. So you didn't, you weren't consulted by a solicitor? Um, nothing, no, nothing. Nothing. Who no. paid for the solicitor, do you know? It was no solicitor, he was a peace commissioner. Peace commissioner, okay. Mm-hmm. And a, and the priest. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know where my mother came up with this priest or whatever, or where he came out of, but he, he arrived anyway. How had they... Um left you in London. Did they not take you back with them? No, they went on back. And um, no, my, well, my, no, where my father went to is, we never knew much where he was, but... Um, why wouldn't they take you back? My mother went home. Why, why wouldn't they take you back with them? Well, I don't think I wanted to go. I'm not mm-hmm. sure about that, but I don't think I wanted to go. Yeah. And I was working, I had a wee job, and I was happy enough, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really, you know, yeah. And what had their attitude been in the very beginning when, when the pregnancy had been discovered? Uh, was it an all hell broke loose type of a situation? Uh, you know. Well, I grew, I grew up in a very, uh, you know, I had a kind of a hard background in the sense that my father was away a lot, you know, and uh, my mother used to go to work and we were left an awful lot to our own devices, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, then when I discovered I was pregnant and my mother was told... First and foremost, she wanted me, the, the father of the family wanted me to keep the child and wanted me to go and live with them, that they'd look after me. Right. But my mother wouldn't have that. She would not have it. And she insisted that I would go to a mother and baby home. Uh, and the reason the family backed off was because she threatened law on them because he was older than me. He was mm-hmm. a bit older than me. And how long had you been in a relationship with the father? I suppose about two years now I know I was very young but I'd known him all about two years you yeah. know mm-hmm. yeah and he was yeah. prepared even over uh, you know over the heads uh, or yeah over the heads of his own family he was prepared to you know stick with yeah, you well, yeah he was he was really and you know like I suppose his family kind of backed off they didn't want him going to jail I suppose that was what they were worried about mm-hmm yeah. Because I was underage. Yeah. Yeah. And he wasn't. Yeah. You know. So what was he? Uh, what three, four, four years older than you? Older? Yeah, he was. He was only about three, I think, three years older. Yeah, that's not much, really. You know. No, not really. No. No. No, he no. wasn't really that much older than me. Yeah. So how did that leave you? How how did that leave you as you then started to try and put your 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 life back together when you came back then to Ireland? What did you do? When I came back then, I I um I used to try and go out and socialise. I, I I always feel my teenage years were taken from me. Mm. I used to go out and try and socialise, and I, I suffered terrible anxiety, terrible panic attacks, and all that kind of thing, and I, I had very low self esteem, and I didn't think I was you know, worthy of anything. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and I that, suppose that, that was the way it was, really. And, you know, I ended up then getting married at 19. Yeah. And would you say that your low self-esteem and your lack of confidence actually stemmed from Besbra? Yeah, I said there was, a, well, possibly my childhood had an effect on me to some extent, but I'd say I, I definitely put it put it down to Besborough yeah. uh, definitely because of the damage that was done there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I and definitely you know, there was terrible terrible damage done to me in Besborough yeah well you see one of the things is that and we've heard similar testimony already that when you're exposed to a particularly traumatic thing like what happened with the uh, delivery when you're already yeah. when you're already stressed to the max anyway 
my God, yeah. that, that drives it home psychologically in ways that like, really can take an awful lot to get over. That's the problem. Yeah, That's yeah. and I didn't realise that at the mm. time. You see. Yeah. I didn't realise why my life was going down the tube. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I mean, I know from, you know, just our group and so on, that even if it's only four months in one of those institutions, I mean, I can speak about my own experience and my first trip into the city after spending four months in St. Patrick's and being really nervous crossing the road, being, yeah, you know, very it. nervous on my And I still have a bit of that. So yeah. it does affect you. Lifelong, it does affect you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I still I still suffer from panic attacks, but I've had years of counselling, years and years of counselling. Right, right. And, and I heard one of the girls saying the first bit of counselling didn't do any good because I had buried this so deep I wasn't able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Like, there'd be a lump in my throat if I tried to tell somebody about all that happened to me. I couldn't tell anyone. Yeah, and it, it wasn't until. I, I eventually got an education and I educated, you know, I, I done all right and got a nice career for myself. But I, I was well on. I was nearly 40 before all that happened. Yeah. But yeah. I remember in the 90s, Sela, it was a Sela Black had a program where she was reunite, reuniting mothers with children. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think it was. Yeah. And I, I remember she used to go through all this stuff and I thought, yeah, because for years I thought I was a bad person and I'd done the wrong thing. Mm. And it was all my fault. Yeah. And it wasn't until the 90s and I got a bit of an education that I realised there was a huge injustice done to me. Yes. I, you know, for years I carried it. And then I had a, an operation, I had a hysterectomy and I was very ill. And I thought, you know, I always thought of my child, always, and your queen, you never forget your child. And I thought, if I died and something happened to me, it would be terrible that I'd never see him again. Yes. And I, I, when I, I came back to Ireland in 95 and I traced him. Right. And um, I, I've traced him since that. I've known him since that. He was 28 then. Right. And yeah. did you, so you went on to marry? I went on to marry and I married a man that was quite abusive. Right. And a drunkard, really. And um, it was a bit of a disaster. No, it wasn't very pleasant. And did you have further you. children? Oh, I have, yeah, two, two other children, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you reconnected with your son? Yes, reconnected with my son. And I still, you know, we still meet up now and again, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's grand. And you how know, was but, it? You know, the, the bond was broken, you know. That's all I can say. And I suppose the first time when I met him, and the first year when I met him, the grief I felt. I was only, the grief was, was shocking. Yeah, yeah. When I realised I missed out on his first step yeah, yeah every little thing he ever done i didn't know any of this yeah you know, i could i could have been he lived in london where i lived where i done my nursing and then his first child was born in the hospital i was training at i could have been standing beside him in the irish center and i wouldn't have known him yeah and did you trace him or did he trace you i traced him okay yeah. and how did he react to well, he, he was very anxious to see me. Now, the adoption agency wanted a whole big rigmarole to go through, uh, you know, counselling and everything. But however he worked it, he could see my address was scribbled out on the letter I sent him and he could see it and the phone number and he just took the bull by the horns and contacted me himself. And that was very it. good. <laughs> yeah. Very so we, we just bypassed all that and we just got to know each other. And there was great welcome for him and my family and there was great welcome for me and his family. Very he was raised good. as an only child and you know there was a big celebration and his his parents that adopted him were lovely and they were so nice and kind so I you got on well with them extremely well but they were as old as my parents and they've passed away since you know yeah yeah that's the experience yeah. of a lot of us as well is that like yeah. you know the adoptive parents were as old as Older. our own parents yeah, that's it and they told me that he was going to the south of ireland so i never doubted but they told me the truth he mm. was 45 minutes down the road from me in England no in Ireland oh in sorry. Ireland Ireland yeah because I came back to live in Ireland I'm sorry I was over back to England a good bit <laughs> okay okay yeah. so he was raised yeah. in around near enough to you near enough to me and yeah. they told me that the, the, 
the night I signed them papers in the back of that car, that's what they said, that he was gone down to the south of Ireland. Right. And that's where I pictured him. And I picture, he said he was gone to a farm and I always pictured him on this farm mm. in the south of Ireland. And I always thought, you know, they're good land down there. And I was kind of thinking, well, maybe, you know, he'd be doing well down there. <laughs> you know, where, and I was qu- quite horrified for where, where he was, you know, when I seen he was kind of so near me. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, was your mum... I was quite angry, actually. <laughs> I was uh, very angry. Yeah, um, um, was your own mother still alive when you reconnected? And my own mother was still alive. And um, I'd say she had fierce regrets, Lord rest her. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, she had. Yeah, definitely. Did she get to meet him? She did indeed, yeah. Yeah, now, he, he, he blamed her for really having him adopted. He couldn't get over it. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose, you know, there's nothing I could do about that. And what about your siblings? Have you got siblings you do? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to get on grand with them, to love them. To That's bits, brilliant. You know, mm. love the, the, you know, to get on very well with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, even, uh, you know, there were consequences for you, um, which you described in, in, in your uh, marriage, which you felt was a failed marriage. Um, because of a, a partner who, you know, do you feel that you were sort of landed into that with your low self-esteem? Like, I, I'm drawing conclusions there. Are they good conclusions? or? Uh, no, you, you're definitely yeah. right. Yeah. Um, um, definitely right. You know, I suppose I wanted to get married and I wanted a child and I was looking for my child back, you know. Yes. Mm. And I, was, I wasn't in a state of mind to be marrying anyone, really. And I suppose, you know, I I went for a man that was very fond of drink and different things. Yeah. Not realising, I suppose, yeah. it was going to be a hard life with him. But I didn't think that I'd get any better anyway, or do any better. That's a terrible thing to say, but... Yeah, but that was because of the way your self-esteem was. Yeah, that's right. I didn't yeah. think, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of... Um, a lot of us can actually identify very well with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 And the counselling that you said, you put yourself through counselling. You were never... Yeah, off- I put, first and foremost, uh, years ago, I used to go to... Uh, I, I did end up with an, an addiction problem and I had a few admissions to a psychiatric hospital in my early years. I stopped drinking when I was 28 years of age. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I did get a lot of counselling outside help, you know, because, but I wasn't addressing the real issue. It wasn't maybe till I was getting older and and in the 90s, that's when I really began to see and look at all this stuff and the damage it had done to me. Yeah, I think it takes a crisis, you know, another crisis for us to actually wake up. Yeah. You know, because I know, you know, just again, going back to my own experience, that it was, you know, a crisis in the 90s that made me realise the grief that I'd been yeah. carrying all of my life. Yeah, the grief, oh, the grief was shocking because yeah. I cried for a whole year when I met my son, so it was buckets and buckets of tears. Yeah, yeah. And is he like yeah. you? Um, I thought he looked more like my mother's side of the fact, you know, like I thought he looked like my mother, funny enough. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, he he's a lovely man. We have a, a nice enough relationship. You know, I can't say... See, the mother and son, It was, the bond was broken. And, uh, you know, and I think that that was the grief as well. The grief yeah. of that was yeah. shocking. Yeah. I yeah. realised that very early on, that the bond was broken. Yeah, yeah. And you can't you can't repair it. No, you can't. No. Yeah. So no. now you have... It's unfixable. Yeah. Yeah. So now you have two issues to deal with, even after the reconnection. You're still putting yourself together. Plus, also, you have to deal with the with the loss of that. I mean, yeah, you have to deal with the loss of that. Yeah. yeah. When do you feel you began to get clear of it in, in your own lifetime, where you were able to steer your own life with more confidence? Um, I think uh, this last counsellor I went to was the one that helped me most. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was absolutely brilliant, you know. Yeah. I, I got no other help, you know. He, he could see all that was going on in my life, you know, very clearly. He could see where it all stemmed from. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. He, he, he was a great help to me. So how long know? ago was that, Mags? That was on the... Um, I could honestly say it's only about 10 years now since I really began to come to terms with this. Yeah. So you, know? you were in your 50s at that stage. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it took it took another crisis in my life. Yeah. Before very. I went for that counsellor. Yeah. You know, um, when you think of the shame issue and the fact that a lot of stuff has come out now uh, about what yeah. went on, has that in any way lifted that shame feeling does it have a connection oh. with your feelings inside oh yeah it, it certainly does you know it, it certainly has lifted and i have healed an awful lot mm. you know and it certainly has lifted it uh, and i do you know i feel very good about myself a lot of the time nowadays and you know that counselor used to say to me gosh all you've been through and you've done so well and then, you know stuff like that and i know i have yeah know? yeah 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 because you know, I, I am beginning to feel all that. Now, yeah. as for religion, I don't practice any kind of organised religion, as you can imagine. I couldn't go near the place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, uh, in, you know there is a lot of shame to go around, all right. <laughs> and none of it belongs to you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 That the, the, you know, the shame was never ours. It was actually the no. shame of the people who abandoned us, really. Oh, yeah. Well, do you know what I often do think, Cathy? If I had committed murder, I would not have got such a sentence. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't commit any crime at all. No crime whatsoever. You know, and the so-called Christians that we, who we were abandoned to, you know. Yeah. uh, Well, I just say, and I'm sure you've read it, that, you know, we were, it was a bit like, you know, the madmen taking over the asylum. That, like, we were the true Christians. We were actually given life. And they (sighs) took ours. And, you know, here's another thing. That even in the healing and even in the feeling good about ourselves, there's grief. You know, because we're grieving. there is, yeah. We're grieving for the years that we've lost of ourselves. That's right. Lost of ourselves. And, and, you know, uh, not only did it impact on my life, it impacted on my children's life. Yeah. I was, you know, if I'm affected, they were affected. So, you know, it was a spillover on a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, my son as well, you know, he, remember one time he said to me, and he, he was angry at the son I had, that was adopted, he said, I should have been with you, I should have been with you, and he was really angry, you know. Yeah. yeah. He really was. Yeah, well, we have to acknowledge that, that, uh, that, you know, that pain can be very acute on the other side of that broken bond as well. Exactly. Very acute, yeah. Yeah. But what is it that, you know, you, I, I'm, I, I, as you know, I don't participate in the First Mother's group because I'm not a mother. So what drew you to the group and, and what are your feelings about what's going on at the moment and what, what you're trying to achieve now for yourself? Yeah, well, uh, what threw me to, to the group, I I was looking for the group. I, I seen it in the Irish Times, actually. I seen a bit about the group. And then I mm-hmm. just uh, clicked on it and Cathy accepted me. You know, like I was accepted and all mm-hmm. that. And I was very happy. And I'm delighted with the group. And it's taken me a little while now. And it took me a little while to listen to the stories as well. Because I got very upset with Catherine Sapone, her comment when she came out and said there'd be no redress. And it wasn't even the no redress, but the way we were dismissed again. I felt I was dismissed again. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, like, this is not important. Yeah, That's well, what I heard her saying. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, we're going to make sure really, that they was, you know, we're, I was hurt. Yeah, absolutely. It's like another rejection. And it's like another rejection, like another hurt that this was not important. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I don't think that that's realised uh, by those who are doing it. I, I really don't think they quite get that this isn't political games we're playing here. This is real people's lives. And when you begin to look into the hurt that was done there, you better handle it right. or You're going to yeah. hurt people again. That's right. That's exactly it. That's what yeah. I just said to a friend that was sitting here today. Yeah. They don't address this now. This country will never move forward. 
it will never ever move forward unless they address the atrocities that were committed. Yeah, absolutely. And it was committed to women and children. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I, I read that article about. Um, there was a, a very good article. I don't know whether was you done it or not, Benton. It was about uh, Bishop Casey's funeral. Not me. Not, no. no, I don't think it was you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they said you know. It was a great article anyway about the boys playing the, playing the GA and everything and they were getting on with their lives and now sure look, the women were, you know, the women were hammered yeah. for getting pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah. That was it, in a nutshell, yeah. you know. We were very unimportant. Exactly, yeah. And uh, do, have you plans to speak with the Commission of Investigation or have you... Uh, apply. I spoke to uh, to the I don't know what the commission already. But to it the wasn't confidential the, committee. That the confidential committee. It wasn't the investigation. Mm -hmm. And how did you find Whatever that experience? And uh, where did that take place? That was in Dublin. In uh, was it up near Leeson Street? Yeah. Way. Yep. And um, it's all right. I found them pleasant enough, and you know, mm. I I didn't really. You know, I didn't think much about it. I didn't get much feedback on it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they said they'd call me again, but I never heard from them. And how long ago and I was rang that? Them. That was uh, la uh, last year. Early last year, I think it had written down that I went to them. Yeah. And they said they'd call me back. And uh, I rang them again there a few weeks ago, but I haven't heard from them since. Okay. And was that at your interest that you were interested in giving testimony to the investigation committee as well? No, they were, no, they said, they asked me would I be interested in giving it because they, they thought on account of my age and everything, you know, that it would be maybe good for me to come and tell them the story, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mm -hmm. fact that you were 15. Yeah, the fact that I was a child. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted me to come back. It was the, their idea. So you haven't heard anything since? I haven't heard anything since. And you did ring them, so... I did ring them as well, and I still haven't heard. Right. That's... You know, there's a lot of the mothers are experiencing this as well. Lack yeah. of acknowledgement to their applications and lack of feedback. And we were also told that there would be counsellors, you know, counsellors made available. And what yes. people are given is just referral numbers. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's right. So So, um, you know, how do you feel about the process now and, and what needs to happen right now? I just wish the government would acknowledge all the injustices that were done to women and children. Yeah. And just just acknowledge it and have a, a proper inquiry because I really don't think that inquiry is, is is doing any good. I really don't. Yeah, no. Yeah. I think it's a flimsy little inquiry. It's more of the same kind of stuff that goes on, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, what's the big missing component? Is it uh, partly the fact that it's all happening privately? Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, I, I feel... I, I suppose I feel there's a bit of a cover-up. They don't want to expose it. That's mm -hmm. what I feel. Mm -hmm. They don't really want to hear the truth. Yeah. Now, I just feel that. I just feel it's, you know, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, you, you spoke about uh, being dismissed on the issue of redress. What does redress represent for you? Um, or was it the redress or the dismissal was the, was the disappointing aspect it, it, for you? Well... It was the dismissal mm -hmm. was the disappointment. Yeah. The dismissal, the way she, she said it, you know. Yeah, it's kind of that a blase. Yeah. 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 You know, I'd love I'd love if they acknowledged all we went through. And even compensation would be very good even at this stage. It wouldn't it wouldn't even go nowhere near ever fixing anything that was done. Yeah. But I was robbed of a life and an education in my early life. Mm -hmm. I was robbed of a decent life yes. in my early years. And I feel I should be compensated for that. Mm. 
and because it, I was abused. Yeah, you know it, the emotionally and physically in that mother and baby home. Absolutely, above and beyond the call of the moral twisted logic of it, right? You know, I mean, they could have put you into Besborough and treated you humanely and with care and love for crying That's out loud. Right. That's right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And the state paid for my keep because I got under the Freedom to Information Act. I got it in a very flimsy little note about me. Yeah. No. Yeah, the state were paying. Um, yeah, the each, HSE it was at the time. Yeah, each one of the homes got um, the head, payment headboard. per head. That's right, the health board, that's what they called it. At the yeah, time. the yeah. health board. So yeah. what we're talking about is state and church, you know, collusion. And, um, yeah, today what we find is, you know, the state are trying to push it off on the, on the religious orders and... No, that... Yeah. Yeah. They all knew what was going on. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Nobody stood up, even the medical profession. Exactly, you know. To this day, that little doctor, I I still can picture him. Mm. And not a word out of his mouth to me. If the, if he was treating the dog, he'd be, he'd have been treated better. I can tell you that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, uh, you've gone a, a long way to turn the shame around, and in, that really is the way we feel that we will turn it around. It's not just for you and I, and you know the mothers that are living, um, but also as we've often spoken about those infants that didn't survive and the mothers who didn't survive. It, yeah, they want the yeah. truth known as well. Mm. You know, so we're yeah. speaking for them too. That's right. And, I, you know, there was, you know, there was stuff I seen in there. I seen this, this poor mother, she was deaf and dumb and she had a deaf and dumb child. And to this day, I think about her. And yeah. I just never know what would have become of her. But I know the child was quite big and I know eventually she would have had to give up that child and he probably ended in an orphanage. Yeah, I know. You know, and she had to go her way. There was um, a, a, a lady, a woman, and um, she was 37, but she only had the mental capacity of a seven-year-old. And she was oh. pregnant on her fourth baby. And she gave birth to that baby on the toilet of St. James's, in St. James's oh Hospital. My oh, my God. And what she used to do... When the nuns were gone to bed in the night time, we'd all go out, you know, well, those of us who smoked, we'd go out, out of our cubicles into the toilet at the end of the dormitory. And this girl used to come out and she'd be telling the stories about how she won medals for dancing the Sugar Plum Fairy. And she yeah. used to she used to dance the Sugar Plum Fairy for us. You see? And... You know, she's not going to be walking into any office to give testimony. And no, she, no, she's, that's right. Yeah. Her memory deserves justice too. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh my God, yeah. And I mean, yeah. I've heard that and almost every mother that I've spoken to have has enca- you know, encountered in their times in in the homes children. Children as I mean, I remember a 12-year-old who it was just, you know, she should have been playing with her dolls. That was in 1974. Imagine. And I heard it mentioned on some radio show that there was there's actually records for children as young as nine in there pregnant. Oh, my mm. God. And I questioned, Mags, just to say to you, the first time when I met Char- uh, Charlie Flanagan, I asked him, was there ever any criminal investigation into how come these young children, pregnant children, were in these homes? And he told me there's guard stations opened in every town in Ireland. Some of them are open 24 hours a day. Mm. Well, uh, the people uh, that we've just spoken of um, do haunt the memories of the mothers. Uh, I know that. And I'm hearing it again oh, from yeah. yourself, Mags, that, yeah, that you remember yeah. that lady. 
And, Remember uh, that lady, yeah, yeah. and the yeah. big child. He was the biggest child you ever saw. Yeah. 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 Okay, well... Hopefully we will, uh, well not hopefully, I think we will, Yeah. <laughs> because the truth will out and uh, this isn't going anywhere, we're not going anywhere and we we are bringing the truth out and you are bringing the truth out, Max. Thanks very much yeah. for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Well, I'd like to thank you, Fintan, very much and Cathy. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, we'll be back next week, I think. Yeah, next week or sooner, actually. Okay, right, we have some more testimonies and I hope you do take the time to join us for that. Good luck for now. We walk the road now The road of darkness We walk that road the very end We could not see before the sunset We could not see before the dawn The feel of strength now in your father's arm With no fear or no alarm I've come here to unlock your dream Dispel the darkness, draw the light so near Don't 